and welcome to my YouTube channel Nady Decoder. And today's lecture we're going to be talking about the symbol type. As we already know that we have eight kind of data types in JavaScript. Symbol is one of them and we'll talk about this today. Before diving into the lectures, please make sure you watch the previous lectures on JavaScript in order to follow along. Let's just dive into the lecture. So by specification only two primitive types may serve as object property keys. One is the string type, the second one is the symbol type. So let's say we have an object. So the key until now we were using it was basically the string. So the other type that we can make use of as a key of a property could be a symbol type. Otherwise, if one uses another type such as number, it is auto converted to string. A symbol basically represents a unique identifier. A value of this type can be created using the symbol. So we can simply do, let's say we have a variable and we can name it anything for now. We'll just name it ID and we can make use of the symbol interface. And upon creation, we can give symbols a description that's also called a symbol name, mostly useful for debugging purposes. Mm -hmm. So for example, within this, I can uh, put any kind of description of the symbol. So over here, I can name it ID. I can name it whatever I want, but for now, we'll just make it ID. Symbols are basically guaranteed to be unique. Even if we create many symbols with exactly the same description, they are different values. The description is just a label that does not affect anything. For instance, let's just say we have this ID symbol. And for example, I'll call this ID1. And then we have another symbol that's called ID2. You can see they both have the same description. But if I do something like this, and I say ID ID1 equal ID2, and I save this, when I refresh, you can see it is false. So they are different actually. If you're familiar with other languages like Ruby or any other language that also has some sort of symbols, please make sure that you don't, you're not misguided. JavaScript symbols are a bit different. So to summarize a symbol, it is a primitive unique value with an optional description. Symbols do not auto convert to a string. So most values in JavaScript supports implicit conversion to a string. For instance, we can alert almost any value and it will work. Symbols are special. They don't auto convert. So we have this ID symbol. I'll get rid of the number over here. And you, you already seen that in the alert, for example, we have um, a number over here. Let's call it num and I will send anything to this. So when I do this alert over here, so basically what the alert does, it takes this number variable and converts it to string. So basically any, any value that you pass to alert, almost all of them are converted to string. But the symbols are special, so we cannot do something like this with that. With this. So if I pass the ID, the symbol ID to the alert function and I save this, and I refresh, you can see cannot convert a symbol value to a string. So that is basically a language guard against messing up because strings and symbols are fundamentally different and should not accidentally convert to into one another. That's a language guard against messing up because strings and symbols are fundamentally different and should not accidentally convert one into another. If you really want to show a symbol, we need to explicitly call dot to string on it, like here. So if you want to really show the, the value of this, then we can simply do dot to string just to convert the symbol into string. And we can save this. When I refresh, you can see that the symbol ID is not alerted. So that's how you can do this. Or if we want to get the description of the symbol, so we can simply do i dot description. When I refresh, you can see the ID. That's basically the description of the symbol that we passed to the symbol. Now let's talk about hidden properties. Symbols allows us to create hidden properties of an object that no other part of code can accidentally access or override. For instance, as you have seen in the previous lectures that we were working with the user objects that belong to a third party code, we would like to add identifiers to them. Let's use a symbol key for that. Let's say we have a user that's, that's 
an object a real property over here with a value John. Now let's create a symbol and we call it ID. And I'll give it a description ID. And then I do something like this user ID. Basically, I'm using the symbol as a key name. And I'm assigning it, for example, another way that's called what. And when I console log this user ID, when I refresh, you can see one. So what's basically the benefit of using the symbol ID over string ID? So let's suppose the user object belongs to another code base. It's unsafe to add fields to them since we might affect predefined behavior and that other code base. However, symbols cannot be accessed accidentally. The third party code won't be aware of newly defined symbols. So it is safe to add symbols to the user objects. Also imagine that another script wants to have its own identifier inside user for its own purpose. Then that script can create its own symbol ID like this. You call it, for example, your ID value or whatever you want to give it. There will be no conflict between R and their identifiers because symbols are always different, even if they have the same name. But if you used a string ID instead of a symbol for the same purpose, then there would be a conflict. Let's say we do something like this and we use a string key instead of a symbol. And we call it, for example, our user ID. And then we add another property, for example, uh, with the same key and we say, dear ID value or whatever. So now here you can see that we have overridden the, this user ID by the newly added one or the old ID has been overridden by the new one. So that's basically the problem over here. If we want to use a symbol in an object literal, we need square brackets around it. So we have already seen that. Let's say we have this user object and we create our symbol over here. Let's say we call it ID and we use symbol. And now do you give it a description ID? So if I want to assign it, basically, I can simply do this ID and I can assign it any value that I want. That is because we need the value from the variable ID is the key, not the string ID. Symbolic properties do not participate in the for in loop. So let's say we have some symbols in an object and if we make a for in loop, on the object itself, then we won't see the symbols or we won't be able to print the symbols values. So let's just quick take a look into example. For example, we have this object and we also add another property, for example, age. And I want to, you know, I want to print out the values over here. The values so I can simply do this is go through the keys for now so theoretically I'll just get name and age over here when I print it you can see only the name and age the foreign loop actually ignores them and also if we use the other method of the object that's basically the object of keys and we assign it the user, so it also ignores them. That's a part of the general hiding symbolic properties principle. If another script or library loops or our object, it won't unexpectedly access a simple property. But in contrast, the object.assign copies both string and symbol properties. So if we have, a, let's say, um, the user object and we want to make a copy out of it, then the symbol properties will also be copied. Let's take a look in a quick example. I'll get rid of this code for now. And let's create another variable. Let's call it user2. And I'll just copy the properties from user. You can see that we have the symbol over here and the rest with string properties over here. When I try to access the ID over here, and I'll just print it. Let's 
you can see that also the symbol values were copied. There is no paradox here. That's by design, actually. The idea is that when we clone an object or merge objects, we usually want all properties to be copied, including symbols like ID in our case. Global symbols. Usually all symbols are different, even if they have the same name. But sometimes we want same name symbols to be same entities. For instance, uh, different parts of our application wants to access the symbol ID, meaning exactly the same property. To achieve that, there exists a global symbol registry. We can create a sim we can create symbols in it and access them later. And it guarantees that repeated accesses by the same name return exactly the same symbol. So that's a kind of a global registry where we can register our symbols and then we can access them by any part of our application. In order to read or create, if absent, a symbol from the registry, we use symbol.4. That call checks the global registry. If there is a symbol described as key that we pass, then returns it, otherwise creates a new symbol with that key and stores it in the registry by the given key. Let's say we try to register a symbol ID. So in order to do that, I'll just make use of the for and I'll pass any key to this. So what it does, if the symbol does not exist with this key, then create it and I'll create for example, another ID, I'll call it ID2, and I'll do the same thing, dot four. And let's say the description is the same now, or the key is basically the same over here. We call it the key and not the description. So it will read it again. So maybe from another part of the code. So let's say we have these two um, symbols over here, ID1 and ID2. So in this case, it will create because we're not registering anywhere the, the symbol. And for example, I want to access this key now, then it will not create it again because the keys are the same. So it will just get me access to this, the same symbol that I created before. So if I do something like this and I compare these two IDs, let's say I'll do ID two and I save this. When I refresh, you can you'll see you'll get a true value because that is the same key that we are accessing from the global registry. Symbols inside the registry are called global symbols, and if you want an application-wide symbol accessible everywhere in the code, that's the way we can go for. So far, we have seen that for global symbols, we we are using symbol dot four, which returns a symbol by name. To do the opposite, return a name by global symbol, we can use symbol key for, and then we pass the symbol. So let's say we have two symbols over here, and we call it, for example, sim1, and I'll just create it, symbol at four, and I call it name, and we have another symbol that I call symbol2, and that's another symbol, and then I'll create it with another ID and I do symbol key for, I will pause it same one and then I'll do the same for symbol two. When I save it, refresh, you can see the name and the ID. So this, this way you can get the symbol by name. The symbol dot key for internally uses the global symbol registry to look up key for the symbol so it does not work for non-global symbols. If the symbol is not global, it won't be able to find it and returns undefined. That said, all symbols have the description property. Let's say we try to do something like this and we are trying to access now. So basically this will be the global now because we are putting it in the global registry and we are not putting this one into global registry. So what it will return now? So as we discussed that the key for basically internally looks for the symbol in the global registry. So when I do this, I refresh, you can see I'm getting the name, but for the second one, I'm getting undefined. So it's not able to find it in the global registry. System symbols. There exist many system symbols that JavaScript uses internally. 
and we can use them to fine tune various aspects of our object. So basically we have different types of, uh, there exist many system symbols that JavaScript uses internally and we can use them to fine tune various aspects of our object. Basically there are a list of internal system symbols that we can make use of like symbol.has instance and symbol.context spreadable or symbol.iterator and symbol.primitive. For instance, symbol.toPrimitive allows us to describe object to primitive conversion. Other symbols will also become familiar when we study the corresponding language, language features. So this is the end of the lecture and I hope you have learned something new in this video. Please like and share the video, subscribe to the channel and make sure to press the bell icon for future updates. And until then, I'll see you in the next lecture.